Hello, this is Jason Wagner. I'm from the University of Oklahoma in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and I am going to discuss the use of ultrasound in the evaluation and management of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. I have no financial disclosures to make relevant to this talk. The outline of this talk uh, is that we will begin by reviewing the cervical lymph node stations, then we will discuss an overview of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma as it uh, in particular relates to ultrasound imaging. Then we'll discuss the uses of ultrasound in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma and finally pathology that can mimic head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. To begin with the cervical node classification. I strongly urge you to become comfortable with this and to use this in reporting. Uh, this is a widespread uh, system that is used uh, both by imaging and by uh, treatment uh, physicians in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Although it may seem daunting, it actually is relatively simple if you focus on four major landmarks that are all visible with ultrasound. The first one that I will begin with is right here, the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, which in my schematic over here is represented by this line. Now, honestly, in the very inferior neck, the, it is the posterior border of the anterior scalene, uh, but what I use is just the posterior border of the uh, sternocleidomastoid and then just extend inferior from the mid-neck. Uh, if you are behind that line, behind the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, then you are in level five or the posterior triangle and that extends all the way back to the trapezius muscle. If you are anterior to this line, then you're in the other levels of the neck. Uh, in this uh, location anterior to the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, then the next key landmark is the inferior aspect of the hyoid bone, something that is also uh, visible with ultrasound. If your lesion is above this level, then you're either in level one or level two. An area of confusion, at least in our ultrasound laboratory at uh, University of Oklahoma, are uh, lymph nodes that are in this area. And the confusion is, well, are they level 1B or level 2? There actually is a fairly well-defined, uh, easy to locate landmark to sort this out. And that is the lateral most aspect of the submandibular gland. If the uh, lymph node or lesion in question is completely lateral to the lateral border of the submandibular gland, then the lesion is in level 2. If it is not completely lateral to the lateral border of the submandibular gland, then it is in level one. If you are below the level of the hyoid bone, then you are either in level six or the central compartment, um, or level seven if you're down uh, very low in the upper mediastinum, or you are in the lateral compartment, which is level three and level four. The border between these uh, compartments is the medial border of the common carotid artery, which is uh, this line on this schematic. Uh, if you are medial to the medial border of the common carotid artery, then you are in level six, or the central compartment. If you are lateral to the medial border of the common carotid artery, then you are either in level three or level four. So those are the four major anatomic landmarks for getting uh, the major parts of the neck. Uh, again, that is the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the hyoid bone, and then above the hyoid bone, the lateral border of the submandibular gland, below the hyoid bone, the medial border of the common carotid artery. If you feel that you want to take this further, then you can subdivide level one uh, into 1A and 1B, and the division there is the medial border of the anterior belly of the digastric muscle. Uh, if you want to divide level two uh, into 2A and 2B, then the key structure here is the lateral border of the internal jugular vein, specifically uh, nodules, nodes that are um, 
well lateral of the internal jugular vein, meaning they have a clear flat fat plane between them and the internal jugular vein are 2B, otherwise it is 2A. And then to divide level 3 and level 4, or level 5A and level 5B, is the level of the uh, cricoid. Uh, in practice, dividing level 3 and level 4 is less important uh, because most uh, neck node dissections are going to involve uh, both of those. But Distinguishing between level 3 and level 2, or level 3 and level 6, is very important as uh, those are different surgeries. So now some examples to apply that. Uh, first, we have this mass um, that is medial uh, to the submandibular gland, uh, and on a longitudinal view is between the mandible and the submandibular gland. So it's in this area right here, and therefore is in uh, level 1 or level 1B. The next example is this uh, partially cystic uh, metastasis of squamous cell carcinoma, uh, which uh, this time, because it's in the right neck, is completely lateral to the submandibular gland, and therefore is uh, in level 2 or specifically level 2A, right in this location. The next example is another cystic uh, metastasis from squamous cell carcinoma. This is in the low neck. You'll have to believe me that it is below the level of the hyoid and even below the level of the cricoid. Um, that makes sense because here is some uh, thyroid tissue. This is the common carotid artery, and therefore this is lateral to the common carotid artery. You can see the compressed internal jugular vein right there. Uh, here is the overlying musculature. This is in level four. This uh, enlarged uh, lymph node that proved to be benign is in level five. You can see it here on the corresponding CT. This is completely lateral to uh, the posterior lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and therefore is in level five. Level six, or the central compartment um, to review, is medial to the common carotid artery. Here's common carotid artery, here's trachea. Another example in a different patient, here is trachea, here is common carotid artery. So these lesions here and this lesion here are in level six, uh, which is a common place to find uh, locally recurrent thyroid cancer um, after a thyroidectomy. Now that we've reviewed the uh, neck node levels, we will begin with a, a discussion, an overview of head and neck squamous cell cancer. Uh, this is a disease that uh, affects about 55,000 people in the United States every year with 12,000 deaths. Um, for comparison, thyroid cancer um, has an incidence of about 63,000 uh, new cases per year in the United States, so these are about equally common. However, um, the head and neck cancer is far more lethal uh, in that it, it uh, causes at least six times more deaths uh, per year than thyroid cancer. Uh, specifically, there is a five-year survival of about uh, 60 to 65 percent with head and neck cancer um, as compared to 98 percent uh, five-year survival with thyroid cancer. Uh, it uh, is more common in males. Um, one thing that is important is that this really is a heterogeneous group of diseases uh, that each have unique biology and a different clinical course and often different therapy based on the location of the primary tumor. Therefore, uh, in the next series of slides, we're going to discuss some of the common locations uh, for primary uh, tumors in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this is a sagittal view uh, from a, a CT uh, that we will use to mark the uh, basic anatomic locations where tumors may arise. Uh, to begin with, nasopharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this is actually fairly rare in the United States, although it is uh, somewhat common in Asia. 
Uh, the treatment is usually with radiation therapy. There are actually two different kinds. There is the non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, which has a strong association with uh, Epstein-Barr virus infection. Uh, and this is what's uh, quite common in Asia. It's highly radiosensitive and uh, has a, a pretty good five-year survival, as opposed to the keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, which is not typically associated with EBV, but is associated uh, with smoking, radiation, and other exposures, and has a fairly poor uh, five-year survival. Um, another thing to remember is that this is also a location where uh, lymphoma certainly can occur and can have similar uh, radiographic features. So here's an example of uh, nasopharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. The primary tumors are difficult uh, to visualize with ultrasound or usually visualized with uh, CTMR or in this case PET-CT, uh, but the nodal metastases uh, can be uh, visualized uh, with ultrasound uh, and uh, nodal metastases from squamous cell carcinoma arising in the nasopharynx tend to be uh, level two or possibly level three and occasionally to occur within uh, the intraparotid uh, lymph nodes. One of the more common uh, primary sites that we uh, see in the United States is oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this amounts for, uh, accounts for 30% of malignant tumors of the head and neck in the United States, but it is a major worldwide health problem, sixth leading cause of cancer death in the world, and in some parts of Asia, uh, accounts for almost half of all cancers. Uh, the risk factors involve uh, things that we put in our mouth, tobacco, alcohol, and in some Asian countries, other things such as betel nuts. This involves the oral or mobile tongue, which is the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, anterior to the circumvallate papilla. Uh, of note, uh, thickness of a tumor greater than four millimeters increases the risk of nodal disease, and there have been reports of using ultrasound directly on the tongue to uh, measure thickness of the tumor. These uh, lesions tend to spread to level 1B or level 2A uh, lymph nodes, um, and it's uncommon for them to spread to level 4 or level 5 in isolation. The treatment for oral cavity cancer is commonly with surgery. Here's an example of a large uh, mass in the anterior oral cavity. Uh, this is visualized with ultrasound from a submental approach. Oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma is a, uh, really a different disease, um, even though a lot of them do involve the tongue, but they are the posterior third of the tongue or the base of tongue. The other location is the uh, tonsil tissue, uh, and then there are other uh, less common locations. Uh, there are two flavors of, of this tumor, um, somewhat similar to nasopharyngeal cancer, except this is uh, whether or not it involves HPV. The HPV negative tumors are often keratinized, and they involve uh, smoking and drinking as risk factors and tend to have a poor prognosis. The HPV positive tumors are often, but not always, non-keratinized. Um, they tend to be more poorly differentiated histologically, however, they do have a somewhat better prognosis, and the strains of HPV are similar to the strains that are uh, commonly encountered in carcinoma of the uterine cervix. The treatment for this disease is most commonly chemotherapy and radiation therapy, uh, although there is a limited role for surgery. And this disease commonly has bilateral uh, nodal spread to level two and level three at presentation. Level one lymph nodes are less common. Here is an example of a large base of tongue tumor seen by a submental approach with ultrasound. These tumors are usually fairly uh, easily demonstrated uh, because they tend to be quite hypoechoic um, and stand out well from the intrinsic muscles of the tongue, which tend to be fairly hyperechoic. And here is a corresponding PET CT image that shows the primary tumor and nodal metastases, one of which is demonstrated here with this ultrasound image. A less common primary location is uh, 
hypopharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, it's only about 4% of head and neck tumors. Uh, they unfortunately generally present at an advanced stage, um, are related to tobacco and alcohol. It's unclear if HPV has a role. These commonly spread uh, to levels uh, 2, 3, and 4, and treatment may be a combination of surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy. Uh, here is an example of a hypovaryngeal uh, primary tumor um, here on the, the PET CT and again on the CT uh, with some nodal metastases uh, which are partially necrotic. The other uh, common uh, location of primary tumor that we see in the United States in addition to oral cavity cancer, oral pharyngeal cancer is laryngeal uh, carcinoma. Uh, this is 1 to 2 percent of adult malignancies. It's three times more common in men and has a strong association with uh, smoking and drinking. There are three subsets uh, of laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma. There's the superglottic, the glottic, uh, and the subglottic tumors. Uh, they tend to spread to levels 2, 3, and 4. However, uh, subglottic tumors can occasionally uh, spread anteriorly to level six or the so-called Delphian lymph node, uh, although this is not extremely common. The treatment for this is primarily radiation therapy with surgery used in both uh, very localized uh, tumors and in uh, very extensive tumors. Here is an example of a primary uh, laryngeal carcinoma uh, seen on the PET-CT with a large level 2 uh, nodal metastasis. Now ultrasound, of course, is not the primary way of imaging the uh, vocal cords. In fact, these are usually just visualized uh, endoscopically. However, uh, you often can actually see the vocal cords with ultrasound. And here you see a large mass hypochoic on the right vocal cord with impaired mobility of the cord. Another site of primary uh, disease is the uh, cervical esophagus, uh, which uh, tends, when it has uh, cancer, to be squamous cell carcinoma as opposed to the uh, lower thoracic esophagus, which uh, often will have an adenocarcinoma. Uh, this is not a terribly common disease, but it is a, a very lethal disease um, with a bad prognosis, five-year survival of only 12 to 33 uh, percent. This can spread to the uh, cervical lymph nodes, but it also can spread to the upper mediastinal lymph nodes and uh, treatment uh, can involve all of the uh, modalities. Here is an example of a uh, primary uh, upper cervical carcinoma that unfortunately recurred with a, a lymph node here um, that you can see uh, on these ultrasound images. You can see it has mass effect on the internal jugular vein. So to summarize head and neck carcinoma, uh, the usual locations of nodal metastases are in level one if it is an oral cavity cancer. Otherwise, most of the metastases occur in level two, level three, and a little less commonly, level four. Level six is uncommon but can occasionally occur in subglottic laryngeal carcinoma. Level five is uncommon uh, except in extensive disease. Another location of uh, squamous cell carcinoma is uh, skin primary. Uh, and where this becomes of greater uh, clinical significance and possibly becomes a lethal disease is with extensive tumors that can occasionally uh, produce perineural invasion and creep along the nerves of the head and the skull base. Uh, this occurs in three to six percent of cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas and in a smaller percentage of cutaneous basal cell carcinomas. Uh, a mid-face location uh, is thought to be a uh, risk factor for, um, uh, for perineural invasion. Uh, most commonly involves cranial nerves 5 and 7, and the symptoms can in include uh, formication, which is a feeling of ants crawling under the skin, numbness, pain, facial weakness. Um, in mid-face location, recurrent disease, male gender are all risk factors for uh, perineural invasion. And when perineural invasion occurs, 
there is a uh, five-year disease-free survival of only 51 percent. Uh, it also increases the risk of local nodal metastases. And MRI, with contrast, is the preferred imaging modality. Here is an example of a small um, primary squamous cell carcinoma of the skin in the mid-face in a 52-year-old male. Um, here you can see the high-resolution ultrasound image of this primary tumor. Unfortunately, he presented with numbness, and uh, these images through the parotid demonstrate uh, branching hypoechoic linear structures, which are uh, the branches of the uh, facial nerve. Usually you cannot see these branches. Uh, you can see them here because of the extensive perineural tumor. To summarize, um, metastasis in the head and neck from a skin primary can occur anywhere, um, but has a propensity to involve the periparotid and interparotid lymph nodes. And here's another example. Uh, this is a metastatic Merkel cell carcinoma of the skin. The other type of squamous cell carcinoma that is uh, encountered in the neck is squamous cell carcinoma, or for that matter, any other type of carcinoma that comes from a distant location, usually inferior to the clavicles, such as lung cancer, or in this case, metastatic uh, vulvar cancer. Uh, the significance here is that these usually involve the uh, supraclavicular lymph nodes in the low neck. Um, to summarize with this slide, they usually occur near the clavicles as the initial presentation of metastasis from a distant primary. Uh, they can uh, become more extensive and creep up the neck, but the most common uh, or the most extensive disease usually remains in the supraclavicular fossa. Thyroid cancer uh, uh, certainly spreads to lymph nodes in the neck. Uh, it tends to involve levels three and four, as well as levels six and seven uh, in an untreated neck. Isolated metastasis to level two or to level five is uncommon uh, in an untreated neck, except in extensive disease throughout the neck. Once the neck has been treated, though, um, isolated recurrences in level two or level five uh, can occur, but still remain uncommon. Uh, disease involving level one is quite rare, um, except in extensive disease. So how do we use ultrasound in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma? Well, there are multiple uh, uses that have been validated in the literature, including evaluation of neck masses, staging in select patients, usually uh, patients with what appears to be a limited stage uh, oral cavity cancer. Post-treatment surveillance um, is used in highly selected patients, um, often again with uh, oral cavity cancer that was not, uh, where the neck was not treated. Uh, in our practice, we also use this for other things, of course, uh, thyroid carcinoma, um, but we also use it for certain um, uh, melanomas of the head and neck and certain higher risk uh, skin cancers of the head and neck. And then probably the most common uh, use, at least in our practice, is problem solving, particularly problem solving after a PET CT uh, that has uh, findings that are unclear how to uh, translate into patient management. So what protocol do we use uh, when we're doing ultrasound of the head and neck in these cancer patients? Uh, well, we um, have an extensive protocol, a comprehensive protocol, that we schedule for a 45-minute time slot. This was very important when we got started doing this. Uh, and in patients who have a lot of abnormalities, these exams still take uh, 45 minutes, occasionally longer. Um, as we've gotten better at these um, and increased the number that we do, uh, many of these exams now take less than 45 minutes, uh, particularly if there are a uh, few or no major abnormalities. One thing that we do at University of Oklahoma, which may be a little bit unusual, is that we tend to scan these patients sitting up, uh, at least 45 degrees, sometimes 75 or, 85 or 80 degrees upright. We do still uh, hyperextend the neck by placing a rolled towel or a pillow uh, behind the shoulders uh, to the extent the patient is comfortable. So why do we sit these people up? Well, 
we found that in our patient population uh, with cancer, which um, many times are older and larger people, that they are far more comfortable in this position, um, particularly those who um, have sleep apnea, use CPAP whenever they recline. Uh, they can become extremely uncomfortable when placed in a supine position with their neck hyperextended. Uh, and, uh, even if they are uh, safe and maintaining their breathing, they tend to uh, be uh, very, um, ha find it difficult to uh, cooperate with the examination. They tend to be breathing heavily and squirming. And so we have found that if we sit them up, that they are far more comfortable, hold still better, and tolerate the exam better. Uh, and when they are sitting up, we scan facing the patient um, standing at the bedside. Uh, this upright positioning also makes gravity your friend, um, particularly for low uh, neck and substernal lesions because with gravity, the shoulder girdle, clavicles, and anterior chest wall subtissues fall down, whereas the neck tissues that we're trying to image tend to fall down less. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to see these low neck lesions. We do occasionally do the more traditional flat supine imaging with the neck hyperextended, primarily for young or thin patients um, who tend to tolerate that positioning much better. We do long and transverse images uh, in each nodal station, uh, but we only measure large or abnormal appearing lymph nodes. And when I say large, I generally mean uh, lymph nodes that approach or exceed one centimeter in short axis. Um, we use Cine sweeps that are recorded in the packs for um, abnormal appearing lymph nodes or particularly clusters of enlarged lymph nodes in which we're not going to measure all the lymph nodes, just uh, maybe a representative one or two. For our non-comprehensive protocols, uh, such as when we're just looking at the thyroid or uh, when we're asked to do a biopsy, for instance, a thyroid biopsy, we always do at least a brief sweep of all of the nodal basins uh, to make sure there are no abnormal lymph nodes because sometimes it will change um, our management in these patients. Here's an example of uh, a case and how we apply um, some of the things I spoke about recently about the um, where nodal metastases tend to occur. This was a 71-year-old uh, female with a history of squamous cell lung cancer who uh, finished treatment about a year ago um, with no current evidence of recurrence in the chest. Uh, she presented with a new palpable, uh, essentially painless right neck mass. And when we scanned this, this looks like a uh, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. You can see an irregularly bordered uh, hypochoic solid mass that appears to have extracapsular spread or just extension right out into uh, the adjacent soft tissues. Um, but when we scanned the remainder of the neck, um, it, we did not see any other evidence of nodal mets lower in the neck. Specifically, there was no evidence of disease uh, in the supraclavicular fossa. And as I said uh, previously, spread from a uh, primary below the clavicle, such as lung cancer, tends to be in the supraclavicular fossa. So this isolated level, um, it's really level two, we had, this is incorrectly labeled level three, a isolated level two metastasis is uncommon um, for a extra uh, neck or a uh, infraclavicular primary, but it's very common for a head and neck primary. So we looked some more and we found this superglottic mass that you can see in this scan as we go down to the cords. And here in CT, here is the primary, or here is the nodal metastasis, and here is the superglottic primary. This is of great importance for this patient because since this is a new neck primary, it can be treated with curative intent as opposed to a spread from lung cancer, which would be limited to palliative therapy. Here's an example of um, evaluating a mass and problem solving. This is a 37-year-old male with no history of cancer who reported a firm parotid mass after a 150-pound intentional weight loss. This uh, gentleman actually got on the treadmill and did what a lot of us need to do and lost some weight. And now he feels this rock-hard mass. And we did ultrasound uh, in transverse and long. You can see uh, an echogenic uh, smooth interface with complete acoustic shadowing below it. 
it looks like a bone because in this case it is a bone. It is C1. We looked at a prior neck CT the patient had had, um, which was uh, also done to evaluate this mass but was reported as, as normal. And you can see that there is a little bit of offset of C1. It's a little bit asymmetrically positioned to the right. Just to confirm, um, we swept up and down and we see the vertebral artery as it curls around the edge of C1. Um, so obviously we did not uh, perform any biopsy uh, in this uh, case and we just reassured the patient. Another example of problem solving of a mass is a 70-year-old male with a history of uh, radiation therapy for laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma multiple years ago, um, who also had a history of lung cancer, who presented with a new palpable mass uh, in the submandibular region. And this is the mass, and what this is, is an enlarged, inflamed submandibular gland. Um, so the question is, well, why? And we followed this anteriorly, and we found that the uh, duct of the submandibular gland was uh, enlarged, and as we swept further anteriorly, we found out why. This was a new primary floor of mouth cancer that was obstructing the duct and was invading the mandible. So staging of head and neck squamous cell cancer. Um, in the TNM staging system, uh, the T stage refers to the primary tumor. Uh, this is not usually where ultrasound gets involved. This is usually staged by a combination of physical examination and endoscopy, plus or minus contrast CT or PET CT. And many of these patients do get a PET CT, except for uh, localized oral cavity and glottic cancers. Uh, I'm not going to go extensively into the T staging uh, because it is unique to each primary site. Where ultrasound has a lot to offer is the end stage. And here is the end staging for head and neck cancer. Um, N0, no METs. Uh, N1, a single ipsilateral MET, less than three centimeters. N2A, single ipsilateral node between three and six centimeters. N2B, multiple ipsilateral nodes, but none are greater than six centimeters. N2C, uh, contralateral or bilateral lymph nodes, none greater than six centimeters and not commonly seen in three, a, a single node greater than six centimeters. Um, extracapsular spread is not technically part of this, but is a very important finding um, uh, when the tumor is just spreading out of the capsule of the lymph node into the adjacent tissues, as we'll discuss uh, in just a few minutes. So a little more detail on end staging. Ultrasound has a sensitivity of 63 to 97% and a specificity reported between 74 and 100% at uh, staging of uh, these cancers by determining uh, abnormal or suspicious lymph nodes. Metastatic nodes tend to be rounder than uh, normal nodes and to lack a, an echogenic uh, hilus. There is no consensus on size criteria, unfortunately, uh, and uh, in our practice we find the size of the lymph nodes to be the least helpful. For instance, look at this. This is a very large lymph node, um, however, it maintains a normal nodal morphology. It looks kind of like a big kidney. You have a fairly uniform, hypoechoic, uh, fairly homogeneous cortex, a uh, visible echogenic hilum, and a hilar pattern of blood flow. In contradistinction, there is this lymph node, which is barely, if at all, enlarged. However, it is more echogenic. It has no uh, discernible echogenic hilus. Uh, it is quite rounded, and this was metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. The other part of evaluating this lymph node, however, was the history. The patient had known uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the, the oral cavity, and this is an unexpected nodal basin. Here is an example of uh, metastatic uh, uh, carcinoma with a non-hyalur pattern of blood flow. At surgery, um, in surgical series, 46% of metastatic lymph nodes of squamous cell carcinoma are found to be less than 10 millimeters, um, another reason why size is not very helpful. Um, cystic nodes tend to suggest necrotic metastasis. The non hyalur pattern of blood flow, as shown here, is not commonly seen but is highly suggestive of metastasis. 
However, very importantly, in squamous cell carcinoma, the absence of a color Doppler signal is not a helpful finding. You often can't see that in uh, metastases. And ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration has a sensitivity of 89 to 98% and a specificity of 95 to 100% uh, and is a very useful test uh, when you're concerned about a lymph node. Um, and importantly, when nodal uh, metastases are present in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, they reduce patient survival by 50%. This is actually uh, metastatic uh, thyroid cancer, which tends to be more hypervascular than metastatic squamous cell carcinoma in the neck, and it nicely shows the non hyler pattern of blood flow. So here's an example of staging a patient with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. This was a 54-year-old female who was thought clinically to have a small, limited oral tongue cancer, the lateral aspect of the tongue, um, that had been proven with biopsy, and the patient was uh, being set up for surgical resection of this tumor, which is the standard therapy for oral cavity cancer. Uh, there were no palpable nodes on examination, but the patient was obese. So the surgeon sent the patient for an ultrasound as the uh, only preoperative imaging test uh, for staging. Uh, and we found a single enlarged ipsilateral lymph node that still had a retained uh, visible uh, hilum. Uh, this lymph node is suspicious, however, a reactive lymph node is also possible in a patient who's recently had a biopsy. So we did a fine needle aspiration. And on the preliminary cytology and on the pap stain, we see uh, abnormal uh, keratinizing cells consistent with metastatic squamous cell. So when the patient had her uh, primary tumor removed, she also had a neck dissection. And fortunately, this was the only lymph node involved here on H&E. You can see the preserved uh, rind of lymph node tissue and then the large uh, metastasis uh, focus of squamous cell carcinoma. Fortunately for this patient, there was no extracapsular spread. There was no spread outside the bounds of the lymph node. But speaking of extracapsular spread, um, here's an example of a 68-year-old female who presented with a left neck mass, uh, no history of uh, cancer, but you'll notice that this mass is solid, it's irregular, it has ill-defined border. You can just kind of see the tumor just creeping right out into the, into the overlying sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, this is a very important finding uh, when you see it because it is a strong prognostic factor reducing patient survival by an additional 50%. Um, and in this case, um, as is not uh, rare, this patient presented with a mass here um, and no known or symptomatic primary, but on PET-CT, a small primary in the uh, tonsil was discovered. Here's another example of extracapsular spread uh, in a level two lymph node uh, in a patient uh, with tongue cancer. You can see the tumor just creeping out, fingers of tumor creeping into the overlying muscle. And here with gentle pushing on the muscle, you can see the deep fibers of the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle not moving normally due to the direct extension of tumor into the muscle. And here you can see the PET-CT primary tongue cancer and the nodal met that we're imaging here. Ultrasound is also used for post-treatment surveillance. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is that the optimum treatment of a patient with limited stage, surgically resectable uh, oral cavity cancer uh, and a clinically negative neck remains controversial. Uh, many patients uh, undergo elective neck dissection, although up to 75% of patients have no tumor um, at pathology from these neck dissections. Uh, some centers have tried sentinel node biopsy, but for a number of reasons, uh, that is not uh, used commonly in head and neck uh, squamous cell cancer. Uh, so another option is um, to do a uh, ultrasound, and if you don't see anything, um, then to just closely follow the patient after treatment of their primary tumor. And if we do this, we often do very frequent scans. And in this case, we have a very low threshold for biopsy. Um, basically, we FNA anything that grows or is at all funny looking. Uh, and we pay particular attention to the expected nodal basins, which uh, in oral cavity cancer would be the ipsilateral 1B uh, and level 2 stations. So here are examples of metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. You can see them 
all labeled here, um, as well as this and this. Uh, and you can see that these um, masses are uh, hypoechoic, but not extremely hypoechoic in general. Um, they can be fairly well-defined. They can be ill-defined. Um, these often have minimal or no internal blood flow. Here are more examples of uh, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this one has a small area of internal uh, cystic uh, change or necrosis. Here's another example, yet another example, and again, another example of uh, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. So how are um, other ways, that, or what are other ways that we use ultrasound? Um, well, one of them is problem solving. Um, this is an example of a patient who had uh, been treated with uh, chemo and radiation therapy for tonsil uh, squamous cell carcinoma and had this PET CT uh, with um, a lot of areas of activity uh, that tended to follow the digastric muscle and the scalene muscle. Uh, so we were suspecting that this was just asymmetric muscular activity. However, due to the intensity and a little bit of maybe nodularity, uh, we did an ultrasound to uh, carefully scour these muscles. We did find a symmetry of the digastric muscles, probably related to therapy, but we found no mass and therefore no biopsy was performed and the patient ha has been fine um, undergoing further surveillance. Another example of uh, problem solving uh, this patient, 48-year-old, um, who had been treated with chemo and radiation therapy for tongue squamous cell carcinoma, had this PET CT, which is highly suggestive of recurrent tumor that is invading and eroding the hyoid bone. However, a surgical biopsy of this area was negative. Uh, so we did a, an ultrasound. Um, we see uh, a mass that actually in this case was hypervascular, which is not terribly common for squamous cell carcinoma, but does occur. Uh, and we biopsied this mass, being careful to stay out of the airway, which is right here, uh, and it uh, showed uh, recurrent squamous cell carcinoma. Other things that you can see if you're looking at these post-treatment patients, you can see um, uh, various types of reconstructions, including a neopharynx after laryngectomy, um, which you can see here. You can see the collapsed cavity in the center of it and the surrounding fatty tissue. Uh, this was a flap reconstruction, the floor mouth, and if you follow this cine loop, you can see the tissues extending all the way up from the chest because this was a piece of pectoralis muscle that is swung up into the floor of mouth. Uh, it's important to understand these reconstructions um, to avoid uh, interpretive errors. Um, here's another example of where an interpretive error could be made. This patient has a neopharynx and then has this area of uh, pet avidity next to it, uh, which on ultrasound uh, was consistent with the diagnosis of a healing uh, fistula post-surgery. Uh, here are some examples of fluid collections. Uh, this was just a, a uh, benign post-op fluid collection, most commonly seen fairly soon after surgery. This unfortunately was a recurrent necrotic uh, nodal squamous cell uh, metastasis. And so if these don't go away, um, they sometimes need to be uh, sampled to make sure that it's not uh, uh, residual or recurrent squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, one thing that can um, cause some confusion is the uncommon but occasionally occurring new presentation of a branchial cleft cyst in an adult. And this is such a case of this 44-year-old male um, with this cystic uh, lesion here seen on ultrasound. Um, but here is a 45-year-old male with a fairly similar appearing cystic lesion in nearly an identical place um, with a somewhat similar ultrasound appearance. This was uh, necrotic squamous cell carcinoma with no primary ever found. Um, these have a, can have a, a overlapping appearance by CT and ultrasound, and so in our institution, we treat these as uh, squamous cell carcinoma until proven otherwise in adults that are old enough to have squamous cell carcinoma, and in the uncommon case that they end up being a benign cyst, well, good for the patient. One thing that does come up uh, fairly commonly are the uh, cystic or necrotic uh, liquefactive changes in uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Here's a good example. This is usually true necrosis um, with liquef liquef excuse me, liquefaction, um, as opposed to uh, metastatic papillary uh, thyroid cancer, which tends to be 
more of a, a cyst formation by the neoplastic cells and has more of an ovary in the neck type look as opposed to squamous cell carcinoma. Potential mimic of uh, squamous cell carcinoma, um, or a, another way of putting it as a diagnostic challenge, are patients with residual masses after therapy. Um, and the question is, is there any viable tumor? Uh, this is commonly encountered in people with uh, particularly oral pharyngeal cancer, which may have large nodal metastases that are not treated with surgery initially, but treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Particularly if the PET-CT is obtained too soon, um, you will still see a residual mass with some PET activity. The question is, is there a uh, viable residual tumor or is it just killed disease that hasn't completely gone away? I will tell you that this is a difficult uh, imaging distinction and oftentimes we have to biopsy these. This is one case where fine needle aspiration usually doesn't work um, because the pathologist cannot tell dead squamous cells from a residual viable uh, tumor um, easily on FNA. So in these cases, we often do core biopsy. Uh, and in this case, it ended up being uh, no obvious uh, viable residual tumor. And this patient was further followed and the residual mass essentially went away. Other mimics that can be encountered include a post-traumatic neuroma, uh, which occurs not infrequently. Um, usually it's more of a delayed five, 10 or more year after surgery. Uh, and it is just a proliferation of cells, uh, not really a true neoplasm at the end of a transected nerve. Um, these can be biopsied. However, they are uh, painful at times during biopsy. Um, here is another example of a neural tumor, a schwannoma, uh, which is occasionally encountered in the neck. You can also encounter carotid body tumors. Uh, these occur in a fairly similar location to the usual level two or level three metastasis of uh, squamous cell cancer. However, these are within the carotid sheath as opposed to adjacent to the carotid sheath, although sometimes that distinction can be a challenge as metastatic squamous cell cancer can uh, surround the uh, carotid vessels. These tumors classically, um, when they're carotid body tumors, splay the bifurcation of the internal and external carotid arteries. They're mostly solid but can have some cystic change and tend to be hypervascular with a low resistance flow pattern. A closely related vagal paraganglioma is shown here. This is um, not uh, necessarily quite as vascular a tumor uh, and uh, shows the cystic changes that can occur in a paraganglioma. Classically, these uh, displace the carotid vessels anteriorly rather than splaying the bifurcation. However, that anatomic uh, arrangement can be difficult to demonstrate. Of course, things that can occur anywhere in the body can occur in the neck, such as this example of an epidermal inclusion cyst. Uh, these classically have dermal contact. They've been described as having a pseudotestis uh, echogenicity or, or echo pattern internally. Uh, they classically have enhanced through transmission, edge refractive shadowing, and they should have no internal blood flow unless they rupture. Um, if these rupture, they become a more difficult diagnosis because they can be an ill-defined, almost infiltrating looking structure, but they still should involve the dermis. Uh, and ideally, you can get a history of a mass that was not very symptomatic that subsequently became symptomatic. You can commonly encounter accessory parotid tissue at the anterior aspect of the parotid along Stinson's duct, usually at the uh, superficial border of the masseter muscle. And here you can see an example as we come out of the parotid and then here is the accessory tissue. Um, this can grow neoplasm just like parotid tissue can, uh, but it's important not to mistake this for a mass. Uh, and then rarely you will see something like this in the face, um, which uh, here is a CT correlate. And this was a silicon granuloma uh, from a um, augmentation injection. So some take home points, um, ultrasound plays a valuable role in the management of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, uh, particularly in the assessment of nodal disease um, and problem solving as well as guiding biopsy. The location of the primary tumor determines the most likely location of nodal disease in an untreated neck. Once the neck has been treated, those rules do not necessarily apply. And multiple benign conditions can simulate squamous cell carcinoma. 
So now finally, I'm going to give a few uh, multiple choice questions for you to uh, evaluate uh, if you've uh, internalized some of this information. So the first question, a patient has newly diagnosed base of tongue cancer and presents for nodal evaluation. What is the most likely place to find nodal metastasis in new base of tongue cancer without prior treatment? So the, the answers are A, level 2, B, level 3 or 4, C, level 5, D, supraclavicular fossa. And the answer is level 2. Um, level uh, 1B um, would be possible, although that's usually more common in oral cavity or mobile tongue cancer. Uh, level 3 and level 4 are also possible, however, level 2 is more common. Um, level 5 and the supraclavicular fossa would be uncommon in this situation. So similar question, but now we're going to say that a patient has newly diagnosed thyroid cancer uh, in an untreated neck and presents for nodal evaluation. What is the most likely place to find nodal metastases? Again, level or A, level 2, B, level 3 or 4, C, level 5, D, the supraclavicular fossa. In this case, the answer is level 3 or 4. Uh, of course, the other um, uh, answer would be level 6, which is another common place to find uh, metastasis of thyroid cancer. And the final question, the patient has newly diagnosed lung cancer and presents for nodal evaluation of the neck. What is the most likely place to find nodal metastases? Uh, a, level 2, B, level 3 slash 4, C, level 5, or D, the supraclavicular fossa. In this case, the answer is the supraclavicular fossa uh, because uh, primaries originating below the clavicles when they spread to the neck tend to be most commonly in the low neck or the supraclavicular fossa. So I thank you for your attention and hope you found this to be a valuable experience.